Welcome to Bible 360 Hebrews. Hebrews addresses and interprets the most important characters and themes of the Old Testament. Plus, one of the most helpful verses in the entire Bible is found in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. The rest of the quotes, discussions, and examples point to Jesus as the way in which God speaks to us today. Now, we don't know who wrote Hebrews, but it was written to Christians who were enduring persecution. Pressure in this persecution made it especially tempting for them to adopt less faithful and more compromising view of who Jesus was, but Hebrews rejects this right away. After all, Jesus was not merely an angel, but is the actual Son of God. He is the anointed and promised king sent to rule eternally over the whole earth. Characteristically, the author buttresses his claims with quotes from Moses, David, and Yahweh himself. Now, Yahweh was traditionally understood to have sent the Mosaic law through angels, but if he has now given a new covenant through his own son, this new covenant in Christ is clearly superior. The widely recounted and known miracles of Jesus were confirmation of the divine nature of Jesus' call. However, Jesus is known not only as the Son of God, but as the Son of Man. Jesus became a human being in order to identify with us, to die for us, and to die at our hands. His suffering was no accident because it proved that trusting in Yahweh might initially meet suffering and even death. Eventually and ultimately, it would lead to God's plan of salvation, which could be trusted in. Jesus overcame all, and even the tempter himself, by trusting God's plan instead of trying a different, easier path. Moses was a faithful servant in God's household, we're told, but Jesus was faithful in ruling over the whole house. Moses and by association, the Old Testament were servants, but Jesus is the son and the heir of the house of God. Now, God spent practically the whole book of Deuteronomy telling the Israelites to listen to Moses. He punished them for 40 years when they failed. In the Psalms and elsewhere, he reminds them of their failures. Those who did not persevere were lost in the wilderness, never to enter the rest. Now, this was a lesson, the author tells us, to future generations not to give up on God, but to rely upon him. However, Israel fell short and never fully controlled the promised land or entered a complete rest. However, in Christ, we have now received a new and true eternal salvation and rest. Just as Israel couldn't hide their bitterness and grumbling and rebellion from God, so too we cannot fool Jesus. For Jesus is the Word of God who will discern the very thoughts and attitudes of our hearts. Which is why the book sharply warns against playing around with faith as if it's a switch that you could turn on or off. This sort of attitude is not only disrespectful of the cross and suffering of Christ, it's also damnable. But if we trust instead of rebelling, we need not fear, for we can approach God's presence with confidence that God will be merciful to hear us in our time of need. This is because Jesus is also our high priest. He was like us, so he understands our weaknesses. Like all of Yahweh's priests, he was divinely appointed. But Jesus was more like Melchizedek than he was the Old Testament Levite priest. Melchizedek was the king and priest of Jerusalem before it was even part of Israel. Melchizedek had no recorded history or genealogy, yet he was so great that even Abraham gave offerings to this priest instead of vice versa. Now, this is a clue that the Levitical priesthood and its sacrifices were just a symbol, a lesson. They could not actually wash away sins or make things right, but they were rather a reminder that a better sacrifice would be necessary. Jesus was not from the Levitical line. He was of a higher and more ancient order. Jesus is a better high priest presiding over a better covenant. He needed only one sacrifice. Unlike the constant sacrifices of the Old Testament, he offered a perfect sacrifice of himself made through faith and obedience. Not a sacrifice for his own sins, but a true sacrifice that atoned for the sins of others. The new covenant is clearly superior, as even the Old Testament itself recognizes. Jeremiah, who was frustrated and a victim of Israel's unfaithfulness, hopefully promised a new covenant written not upon stone tablets, but written upon human hearts. God would deal directly with and graciously with his people forever washing away all their sin. Likewise, the eternal tabernacle is actually the body and incarnation of our Lord. It was the blood of Christ offered up by Jesus himself, which reconciled man to God. The Old Testament requirement for blood in key places like the sealing of the covenant or forgiveness demonstrated the necessity of Christ's blood freely shed for us. All of this helped demonstrate the once and for all redemptive nature of Christ's sacrifice. The majesty and magnitude of what has taken place in Christ's death teaches us a greater appreciation. Therefore, we repent and hold unswervingly to the hope we profess in Christ. Christians meet together for mutual encouragement as we earnestly follow our Lord. No matter what we lose, we have faith in God's promises. Faith hinges on hope for that which is promised but which has not yet been experienced. Noah believed
believed the words God spoke to be worth following even when no one else around him believed. Through faith, Abraham became the father of many nations because he believed an impossible promise. Faith allowed these people and many others to inherit instructions or trust God's promises even when it meant abandoning security, riches, reputation, family, or life itself. None of these folks actually received what they were promised during their lifetime. They died waiting hoping. Looking back, we can see God kept his word to them, but still something was missing as they waited for Christ. So, don't be surprised when you must persevere in hope without completely satisfactory answers. That's how it's always been, and it's how it will be for us too. So don't wimp out. Rather, keep the faith. It would be foolish and disrespectful to ignore so great a hope of the Son of God crucified for us. If God calls us to wait, well, it's the least that we can do. The last chapter closes with a hodgepodge of practical advice and commands, including exhortations to be sexually pure, to avoid greed and bizarre twistings of the basic message of the gospel. It encourages faithful support of leaders and promises the continued support of God as we continue to do good works and he sustains us.